Welcome to the Roots Podcast, where we peel back the layers to find out who speakers are behind their name, credentials, and organizations that they work at or for. I'm your host, Sean Pitcher. You can find me on Instagram at Sean underscore Tactical RD. Today's guest we have on is Andrew Weber, who is the founder of, is it Avanto Cold Tufts? Avanto. Avanto Cold Tufts. I knew I messed that one up. Um, he's also had careers as a professional photographer, wellness consultant, with ex- expertise spanning across taking stunning visuals, as you can see in his backdrop that he has right now, uh, promoting health and coming up with innovative solutions for uh, a variety of different companies. Um, really appreciate you coming, Andrew. Uh, excited for this chat today. Oh, thanks for having me. Long time coming. Um, yeah, Avanto, um, we can get into that, but uh, interesting kind of way how we, how we came about the name. So, um, well, yeah, I think really a little bit about myself is growing up as a kid, I was always fascinated, fascinated with like five by seven and four by six pictures. Um, Hmm. and I used to look at like ones of my parents, my grandparents when I was little and my dad used to have a film camera. I used to like take film photos and, um, in eighth grade, they actually had a photography class where you learn how to develop your own, uh, film. So like anything, like there's an assignment, right? It's like, Hey, you know, take a picture of X, Y, Z, come back, develop the role of film, and then kind of go through the whole process to make it into a picture kind of fell in love with that process and, um, really wanted to figure out how can I turn that into a career at some point and always getting sports illustrated sports Illustrated kids, you know, magazines. And I was like, man, these pictures are amazing. I would like study them. Did they stop making Sports Illustrated? Did I see that not too long ago? Yes, but I think someone maybe purchased them and it may be coming back. Not too sure, but I don't see it like out and about like like I used to. Yeah, it was like active. Like you go anywhere and you're going to get Sports Illustrated. The biggest star of the time was on. Yeah, I used to get it every single week. That's like the big deal. So um, from there, like I just like studied and studied and studied, like self-taught everything. And, um, when I went to university of Toledo, um, as a place kicker, you know, this is really before like even social media was, was even a thing. And even, you know, team photographers or really anything that was like forward facing for fans to be a part of, um, I would literally just take pictures of like teammates in the locker room and literally print them out and give them to them. And that was like when Facebook, like still had like a dot edu. And um, like, I was going to say, was that like the Instagram back in the day? Like, yeah, pretty much. Because because I remember, you know, being at a couple of places, like as soon as somebody took a picture of them, the first thing they wanted after the game, hey, can you send me those 15 pictures you took of me sure. so I can like post them on spaces? Yeah, 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 totally. And um, that was kind of like behind the scenes that like no one ever like had before. So from there, like it's kind of like turned into something I wanted to pursue like after college. So, yeah, I mean it's always been like a huge part of my life, not as much anymore, but like, I just kind of do it for fun now. So is that something you like went to study for in college or like you said, it was all self-taught. So you did it on the side with what's your degree and like what you were doing as a place kicker in college at the time. Yeah. So I was getting a marketing degree. Um, Obviously like journalism, like was a degree back then, but learning like I just didn't quite see it like as a big picture. You know, I think it's like an art, right? Like, yes, you can be taught to be a painter or a drawler or or a sculptor, but like the best ones are always kind of like self-taught. They put their own spin on it. Mm -hmm. Um, I was never the best student. And now as I get older, like I actually like um, learning more than I did then, which is funny because both my parents are in academia. Um, How funny is that? (laughs) Yeah, right. And, um, you know, it's just kind of like bare bones student just kind of got it through and, and checked the boxes. And I, I wanted to figure out, like, I, I've always dreamed about having a photo on the cover of Sports Illustrated or something in there. And um, funny enough, my first breakthrough, I was like a freshman or a sophomore, and I didn't get to travel with the team to away games. So I would get photo assignments. And um, this is back when USC was going to play at Ohio State. And, um, I got a friend of mine. He's like, Hey, you know, we're looking for a photographer, um, for, for this game for sports illustrated. Would you be interested? It's like, sure. Absolutely. So fast forward, went to the game and I don't remember who the player was, but he like high stepped into the end zone and, um, 
that was like a two page spread in Sports Illustrated. That was kind of like my first like breakthrough while I was still playing football, which is funny. And that was also the same year that Toledo played played Ohio State at Cleveland Brown Stadium. So it, it was just ironic because we played Ohio State the next week. It was just super funny. That's wild. The coincidence kind of just saw it. Saw yeah, totally. There. So did, um, did you play? Did you play soccer and then became a place kicker, or did you do, were you always um, a kicker? Like played soccer, football? played soccer a little bit. Then, like one point in my life, I was like, running is the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> but like, I still like kicking a ball, so I was like, I oh, agree. <laughs> interesting. So, um, literally, just like started kicking the football and just kind of like went to some camps and kind of figured it out. Um, I think that's one thing like I've, I'm very good at, like throughout my life, professionally and personally, is like just figuring it out. Like there's no one that like I lean on. It's like, hey, I'd rather fail five times before I figure it out. It's what you do after the failure. I think that's the that's the exactly. biggest thing. Either exactly. Either you're just gonna let, you, let it bury you. I can't do it. No one's gonna want me. Yada yada yada. It's sure. like, all right, how do I learn from this? How do I apply this lesson to something else that's gonna help push me in the next direction I'm gonna go? Even okay. though maybe my initial thought and direction I wanted to go wasn't gonna happen, how is that gonna take it elsewhere for the next step that I have my my journey? Yep. Yeah, and then you mentioned like art and journalism. You know, my brother was an art history major, and <laughs> he very quickly found out like, yeah, there's not many curators out there, and oh, there's not really a lot of jobs in art, so I'm gonna have to switch to something else so I can actually make a career out of it. But. Yeah, and I was very, very fortunate. Um, I did it for ten years. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Olympics. Um, I've worked with. I've been to Super Bowls. I've been to World Series. Um, I've basically been to every single sporting event except for FIFA, World Cup, and also the Masters. Those are the only two I've never been to. Um, but yeah, like you know, I think it's kind of a young man's game, and I kind of saw the writing on the wall a little bit as it started to move into from print into digital. And you know, a lot of teams and schools were hiring their own photographers and, you know, they're kind of bringing that stuff in house to can kind of control a lot of the narrative. And I kind of just kind of like fell out of love of like the passion for creating. Cause like, you know, you're kind you of like, like you had all this freedom and then like, all right, they're just kind of stripping my freedom. Like they're telling me what I have to do. Versus yeah, like, exactly. I could a just little bit. Do whatever I wanted. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, before it was just like, hey, you know, go and cover this game or go and follow this one particular person. But it kind of got a little more like narrow scope. Um, it's like, hey, we only need this player. And once he's done playing, you can leave. But like, I was like, well, I'm already here. Like, mine's all like, why can't I shoot all these other players? Or like, what exactly. One, one action you never know, happens right? that's not that player, but everyone's going to talk about it anyway. So why sure. not have the options to shoot them? Yeah. And then, um, you know, then like, Instagram came around and, you know, newspapers are starting to get, you know, thinner and thinner. Cause like back in the day, like, you know, <laughs> seriously, you know, you would, you would, you would strive for like that. It, it, it's called a one. So like above the fold. So like you would get a newspaper and it'd be like the feature photo before you'd ever open it up. And like, that's like what you always strive for. It was like that, or like the cover of sports trailers dirty as being the magazine. And once I kind of saw that kind of switching to more digital, I was like, well, how do I transition out of this? What, what do I want to do? So like in 2016, when we moved to Chicago, I kind of took my fitness, my sports photography and kind of pushed it more into like the, the fitness side of things, doing photography for like Soul Cycle, Barry's Bootcamp, Orange Theory, and creating those kind of like marketing assets for those guys. Um, and then that's essentially like when I was literally like dropped into this like boutique fitness world before really like fitness was like really like gaining traction mm -hmm. um and i kind of like stumbled into like health and wellness like kind of on accident almost um so i essentially tell people one day i literally forest gumped it and um <laughs> if anyone's ever been to chicago like on lakeshore path it's like 55 miles long and um, you can literally just basically run from the sh city of Chicago almost to Indiana and almost to Evanston. Wow. And I would literally just go out my house and I would just run until I couldn't run anymore. And I would just run back. And I was literally running half marathons basically like every week. And um, about six months in, seven months in, no training at all, nothing. 
And um, I woke up and I had this pain in my kneecap. And I was like, all right, this is weird. Like being a, being an athlete, I was like, all right, let's just do the things I knew. Rest it, ice, compression, you know, the old school. Couple right? of stretches here and there. Like, yeah, exactly, right? It'll, it'll yeah. dissipate, it'll go away. Yeah, totally. But uh, that was not the case. Um, so went down the, you know, I would say the traditional kind of medicine route and, you know, went to chiropractor, went to, got an MRI, you know, saw some different people and just said, hey, listen, nothing's broken, nothing's torn. Um, let's kind of figure out like a game of, game of attack. But everyone just said, hey, if you stop running, it'll probably go away. I was like, well, that's not really the goal of this exercise. I would nice. like to figure out how to treat it. And then how do I prevent it? So that's the physicians that don't have experience working with athletic populations that totally. just stop exercising. No, you, you don't <laughs> understand. I, I have to do some type of movement and training. Yeah. That's not the answer I'm looking for. Let's still try to solve it, but how can I still do something? Sure. So that was kind of like the very eye opening to me of like, no longer being an athlete, still trying to be athletic, but also like, I'm still like in the normal population now. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I found, you know, this lady who did manual therapy really before like manual therapy was a big thing. Um, and you know, I paid her a thousand dollars and, you know, bought these 10 sessions and she's like, listen, your, your muscles and your, in your, in your pliability to your tissue is basically so tight. Like causing, a rock. Yeah. Literally like a rock causing all this pain and tension in, in, in my kneecap. So essentially my IT band and my calf were so tight. They're basically just pulling apart of each other causing that tension hmm. fast forward she healed me kind of kind of got me back to back to normal and then i was like well shit like i can't afford you know doing this keep... all the time it's exactly so what what things are out there that i could do that are very similar modalities right so the cross ball stick foam roller you know that was kind of like about it for the most part in 2016 um then I saw this thing called a Theragun in uh, Men's Health Magazine. A blurb was like literally like two sentences. And I was like, the next thing that athletes will be using on the sidelines. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. Um, so did some research about it, bought one. Um, it was like $600 at the time. So then Dr. Jason, who was the founder, had a handwritten note in the box. Um, I sent him a completely cold email, told him my story about me forest gumping it one day and how I used your device every single day. Two months later, we're sitting down having lunch. And, um, you know, I was like the 10th or 11th employee at Theragun, now Therabody, like when I started. So that was like literally like my intro to like. And that's where we met because you yeah. were, because at the time we were, I was at IMG Academy. I had just got there. It was 2019. Yeah. And then we had partnered with them guys. And I know they, they still have a pretty expansive partnership with them. And you just showed up and you're like, Coming in guns blazing with yeah, two so staring guns, you're like, who wants to get this used yeah. up? <laughs> and that was really like, I think, um, very eye opening to me as far as like, let's not use this not only as a recovery tool, but then I learned about like how to use it for like warm activation, reactivation, all these different things. And then I was just like immersed into this like health and wellness. And that, then it was in my own kind of power to figure out like what I want to make this. Yeah. Um, and I would say still to this date, it's like helping just every ordinary people just figure like how to live a healthier life. I don't care if you're like the biggest, the strongest, the most ripped or jack, but just take care of yourself. Yeah. I want to back up to the, the photography sure. a little bit. So sure. obviously you had the big break, you had the one big picture in the photo shoot with the Ohio State, but I guess how does the world of photography work? Like, you had one big break. So then like everybody wants to use you as the person to take pictures and like take pictures for them and like have it on their main pages or like, how, how does that whole sure. system work? Cause everyone, everyone's job and environment has a little bit different organization to it or who, who you would communicate with to kind of move yourself up in that arena, I guess. Sure. So there's kind of three, three, three avenues to go about it. Right. So you either get hired directly by one of the magazines sports illustrator espn or um you know any any magazine that you see on, on the shelves that still exists today so you work with like either like their editor or a photo editor like hey let's we have an assignment for you and this is what we're looking for so that's kind of one avenue another avenue is um 
what we call like a wire service or an agency. So like there's Getty images, AP images. So they'll hire you to cover things a little bit more broadly. And then, you know, they can be used for a wide variety of different things. Or the third thing would be, hey, um, I'm hired by like a Nike or a brand to go out and physically create that content directly for those brands. So really, you know, it's all really about all the relationship that you have with, you know, either an art director, an editor, um, or basically uh, a producer. So if they like you, it's more of just like, hey, like I trust this person to get the job or I've worked with them in the past. So we're going to give basically the assignment, assignment to them. We're going to hire them to do a specific thing. Um, you know, for a while, it's very just kind of like geographically like located. But like as my relationship with them grew, it was just, hey, we need you to go do something in California. Or we need you to go do something in Florida. Or, hey, you need to go to the, the you know, we're going to go to the London Olympics or we're going to go to the Olympics in Whistler, Canada. So it's kind of one of those things. It's just the relationship you have with them. And then I would say it's also so a little bit of seniority. So it's like, oh, you know, he's already done X, Y, Z. He understands how it all works. Send him again. Yeah, like you have the expertise in all these different platforms or different sports. So it's like, in that case, you're very diverse in the type of, photography in this case yeah. that you could do so it's like all right well if he can shoot these five to six different sports what is it going to be if we throw him into the olympic arena like yeah, we already like, know the quality that he's going to be able to provide us and he's being able to have the work to show that he can do that so it's an easy like yep have him go like the olympics as it's coming up here you know opening skirmish is, is on friday the olympics is one of those things that you truly don't understand the behemoth of it until you actually physically go and you're thrown into a completely random sport you've never seen in your entire life. I've never seen canoe slalom before. I've never seen <laughs> trap and skeet or pistol shooting. So like, yeah. you're like, all right, well, I'm here. I got to figure this out. And, you know, you're with a hundred other photographers trying to do the exact same thing. So how do you kind how of you remove, stand apart? How do you remove myself from the pack? And how do I like go stand someplace different? Or how do I look at it through, you know, a, different lens per se how do you just kind of separate yourself from you know the masses did you ever try to like use trends i guess or like if certain images or editors were like hey this is a way or form to take it right now that people are receiving it more or better than others or is it more just come down to the photographer and like what are my skill sets and what am i good at that's a lot yeah, it's a little bit of hybrid of both um i think it's just your eye and how you see certain things and also to like your understanding of certain sports, right? Like obviously being involved in football a lot in my, in my life, like football is my bread and butter. Cause I kind of understand like what was going on. Um, and still to this day, like when I still watch football games, I, I kind of know like, Oh, this place literally going to go right to this corner of the end zone. Cause like there's actually like statistical percentages of like anything inside the red zone the percentage chance of it going to like the corner pylons or the corner of the end zone is like 67 or 70% of the time. Two and feet then, down, make this much separation and just yeah. put it in the bucket. <laughs> and, and that's the thing that like, I think I was very good at to kind of understand like how, how players where to position yourself because you knew what yeah. was going to happen. And then that too, you know, athletes are very superstitious, you know, and they kind of do the same thing over and over and over again. And like, mm -hmm. um, I just had the opportunity just to visualize a lot of those guys. And like, you know, I, I watch enough sports and is involved. And I was like, Oh, I saw this guy do this one time. So most likely he's going to do it again. So how can I make sure I'm in the right spot at the right time? Yeah. It is a game of luck sometimes. It's, and it's, yeah, it's like mostly like you see patterns, you see trends, especially everything now is so data driven. Sure. It gives you enough baseline information that you're like, all right, I have an array of options that I can do here. But if I know if I'm in these places at these times, I'm probably going to have the best chance or best success to get, sure. in this case, the shot that I want that's going to lead to what they are going to want from me at, at the end of the day. Like, if you, like, that photo of, like, Ezekiel Elliott, like, he's, like, looking, like, through his face mask. And, like He's looking uh, through your soul is what he's doing. Much, yeah, so, like, you know, I knew at Ohio State they do something very particular, like, how they do stretching. I knew exactly, like, where he's going to be lined up at this exact same time, so I just positioned myself in the right spot, and that was the photo. Awesome. So we, we had this obviously college football career. We transitioned to obviously doing sports photography. 
now you've obviously mentioned their body. So did, did that bachelor's business marketing degree actually help you? Or is it more so again, like having conversations, shifting into that job, having the right connections, still Just having, let's say a extroverted personality allowed you to be molded oh, into what they wanted you to do. Yeah. I said, st until still to this day, my degree is completely useless. <laughs> I hear a lot of people say that. <laughs> I was learning how to market via a billboard and like in the newspaper. Now it's, I have no idea, but like, it's more just who, you know, being outgoing, trying to figure out like, Hey, how do I, how do I get into here? You know, mm -hmm. I've always been like, Hey, listen, if you don't ask, you are never going to find out. And I kind of, the worst they're going to say is no. And the best exactly. they're going to say and, is yes. Wow. It's either yes or no. If they say yes, great. Door opens for you. If not, no. Go knock on another door. Yeah, there's 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 a bill, millions of billions of people out there, so it's not like sure. there's not going to be somebody that's going to say eventually. Oh, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then it's like working at Therabody, and then like you know, it's a startup right at the time, so it's like roll up your sleeves and let's kind of figure it out. Is everything from like, hey, like, how do we get a Theragun to, you know? this person or like, Hey, like, how do we get it into a gym? And it's all just like, Hey, can I come and like do some demos? And then that kind of just opens up their door. Cause like people will kind of always like allow you to do something for free once. And that's like, Hey, Oh wow. That was interesting. Like well, they want to see stuff in real life. in person. Yep. yep. Anyone's going to invest and spend a lot of money. Like, does this thing actually work? Can I actually, especially like, you know, in the world of athletics, especially with all the technology now, like, a lot of times these companies, hey, here's a free option. Give it a try. See if it works for your population. Or you're saying it does all these things. Well, actually, okay, I'll test it on myself. Or I'll test it maybe on one athlete or one person that I know that's actually going to follow through and do it. And is it actually giving us the information data that we want that now if we want to get more of it, cool, we can broaden that and get more devices because we have a sense and idea that it's going to have a bigger impact across the board. Exactly. And I think that's where a lot of people get tied up into there's there's too many things, there's too many shiny objects and figuring out what works for you individually or what's working for your team and stick with that. There's too much data sometimes where it's like, hey, listen, I know that a foam roller and a lacrosse ball for 90% of the people that's going to work. But for someone who has used that a lot. They need a different stimulus to work something a little bit differently. So, hey, you might need to use a Theragun or you might need to change the attachment or, you know, you might need to be have to do some more manual therapy or stretching. So it's just figuring out the modality that works for different people for, you know, different acute injuries or then how to one prevent something. It's like ice cream, right? Not everyone likes chocolate. Not everyone likes vanilla. So you kind of have to figure out what your flavor is. It, it falls into so many different fields. You know, you're rotating on a tool. Or it's like exercise, like you're not going to do the same exercise every single time. Eventually, like you're going to have to rotate that out, choose something different, tweak the position, the hand placement, whatever it is, like you said, to create that new stimulus, or you're just going to eventually plateau. Now, it doesn't yeah. mean you can't come back to it, but maybe at that time or, or during that certain situation, you might have to find something or rotate out something in at that point. But Like me for a Theragun, right? Like I've been using it almost like since 2016 doesn't do much for me anymore like i actually need yeah. to hire a massage therapist to actually come and do manual work now because like i just can't i can't get deep enough now essentially and it's just a different frequency than like actually use like manual therapy yeah so i guess where was it where is the next out i know because you've been with so many places so yeah. i know you're kind of in this like solo entrepreneur type position so when you got done with therapy is that when you started to almost do contracting services and like almost providing services to companies or to go out to companies and like help with startups? Like how did that? Yeah. So, you know, in my time at, at Therabody, you know, Theragun, I still call it Theragun because that's what I know it as. Um, it was, you know, everything from working with sports teams to working with retail, to working with, you know, big business to figuring out where can this product live? And then once I kind of understood how all of these things worked, I kind of went to a couple different companies that were kind of in that space and say, hey, listen, I kind of help them do this. 
get into retail. So I can help you get into retail or, Hey, I can help you get into a sports team, or I can help you with sports sponsorships. And from there, I started building up kind of my own, just kind of like network of clients per se to one, help them a little bit. And sometimes it was short. It could have been a three or six month at contract. Some of them were a year long, but at the end of the day, like they were at the like bare bones beginning stage, but they wanted to grow. So I kind of helped them with marketing pitch decks. I wasn't a product designer, but like, Hey, like box design, what does that look like on shelf for, for different retailers? And just really just being almost like an advisor or guiding them along the way. And I've learned that like, I'm only attached to tactical products where I can physically show it to someone that can touch, feel it, and they can use it. And that is kind of like my like bread and butter. Yeah. So almost their, their body gave you the foundation to know how each of those pieces of the business quote unquote works. Yep. And, and then it's like, you have another out upstart that's coming in it's like cool like i know how to, I've, I've had a taste of how all these work and like i see you're at this point and you're saying you want to get to this point and i know how to do a lot of these things so let me come in give you advice in each of these sections for your departments so to hopefully enhance your business so that you guys can take the next step that you guys are talking or speaking about that you want to do exactly and it could be anything from like I did some work for uh, like a sock brand and they wanted to get into retail, right? Like how, how, how do we get into retail? We've only been selling, you know, online only. All right, great. Let's make some connections for you. Let's make sure you have packaging. How's it going to look on the shelf? How's it going to hang? Just like little stuff that what those retailers are looking for to make it as easy as possible for them to basically like put the product in the store. Yeah, because it's almost like when you go in these stores, right, a lot of times you may have five to 10 seconds of somebody's attention. So it's yep. like what it what is graphically, visually, like you said, how it's hung or laid out, what is going to grab that person's attention so that gives so then they take the second step, which is, oh, this looks pretty cool. Like, let me step over to look at this. And then it's like, do they take the third step? Like, are they going to purchase it? Like, are they going to come back to get it? Does that start up a conversation with other people that gets them to come and buy it? There's that whole, I'm sure, psychological mind game that you're trying to play. Like, how do we get this consumer that wasn't going to buy anything here to now make the decision to buy something? Yeah. And also, too, I think of it as almost a, a full circle ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you need the digital presence, whether it's on social or through website or something like that, where it's like, oh, OK, I saw that. Oh, wow. I just walk into, you know, a Dick's Sporting Goods or something. It's like, oh, wow. I saw that online, but now I can physically go and see that in person. Yeah. Okay. So then I may not purchase it directly from them yet, but then down the road, I get a recommendation. Hey, I, I just bought one of these products. Oh, I just saw that uh, at Dick's Sporting Goods, or I saw this online. Okay. Now you're basically my validation. Now I can go back and purchase it from one of those two different places. So, And, and the more opportunities you can provide somebody to purchase the product from, Correct. Makes it so much easier. Yeah, correct. <laughs> or, or like right now, Amazon, that's the biggest vendor. Like, cool, I get yeah. on Amazon, like everyone's going on Amazon for everything. So it's sure. like. And I think now I don't have the patience to go and like, unless I physically need something right now. And yeah. I know a, a retail store is going to have that. I necessarily don't necessarily have the patience for me personally to go in and like, mill around i can't find it or i have to go ask for help and by the time i do that like i could just order it online and have it in two days right so yeah the, the convenience and how quick we're able to receive products is crazy is <laughs> it's at like, lightning speeds yeah it's crazy it's like you know i want it in my house before i order it <laughs> yeah then you're getting mad because you're like it said it was supposed to come today at 4 p.m totally. and it's taking <laughs> another day like what the hell i paid the extra money for this or that's why I have Amazon Prime and it shouldn't have totally, showed up already. For sure. So let's go a little bit into your, your cold tubs. Sure. What, what started you to want to go down that path? So I guess because it seems like you worked for a company, you started doing contracting work, which I know you still do. And now it's like, sure. all right, now I'm an actual founder and owner of. Yeah. The um, I guess um, I was trying to solve something for myself. Um, you know, obviously being an athlete, like, old school, you know, 
trash can ice and water is like how we used to do it. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. you know, a lot of people still do it that way. Obviously, it's a, an up and coming trend slash fad, however you want to kind of put it. But like, obviously, in the sports performance space and, and athletics, it's been around for, for decades. Um, and I was actually looking, looking at purchasing one myself at some, at some point. And I just literally bought a horse trough, filled it with water and kind of, kind of went from there. And then I was like, okay, I like this. And then I was like, okay, well, how do I buy a water chiller? Then, you know, how do I then get a pump and filter to it? And I would literally just like tinker. Literally like the first version was literally that horse trough. Second version, I was like, okay, maybe I can find like a different modality or a different vessel that could hold water. Um, and then fast forward, you know, found basically like these very beautiful looking like acrylic tubs, um, bought, bought one, I was going to build one for myself. And out of pure curiosity, I, um, posted it on Facebook marketplace and a gentleman reached out and goes, Hey man, saw that, like, you know, what's the deal with it? Um, can I buy it? I go, absolutely. So I sold one to someone completely randomly on Facebook marketplace and built another one for myself, rinse and repeat. Um, kind of the rest is history, but I wanted to make sure two things. One, they're all made in America. Um, and then two, at the same time, I wanted them to be affordable in comparison. And if you kind of do the math, ice is super expensive right now. So like, it's like two or $3 for like a 16 or 20 ounce bag. So why and is ice up? Everything's expensive. Because of inflation in general. <laughs> yeah. But like, you know, if you actually want to do it every single day, you're going to spend, you know, 50 to $60 on ice to be able to do it one time for the ice melts, depending on where you live. Yeah. So in the grand scheme of it, it's like, how can I keep one, that same ice, keep it cold? How do I, how do I make this affordable for people that want the convenience of doing it every single day? So mm -hmm. I, I didn't know anything about plumbing or like how it all works, but here we go on the self-learning trade again. Yeah, I, <laughs> I experimented and, you know, it's like, okay, like sourcing all of the things, you know, so I sourced, you know, all the pieces myself. I sourced all of the contacts for all the different components. Um, and I literally assemble every single one myself. Can't get much more uh, handcrafted than that. No, it's <laughs> you're out. And people think they're like they're like made in this huge factory and stuff like no i make every single one of them so when people like so do you have your own little i, I feel like you were doing it from your home for a while are you still doing your home or do you have the actual place where you assemble them now? nope still doing our driveway <laughs> everyone <Ooh. laughs> everyone do you think eventually get big where you'll like transition to that or do you want to just kind of keep it like this small little side project that's just I like, like, I, I like your boutique right because i think um it allows me to have conversations with the consumer and I kind of understand like what their needs are. Yeah. You know, I want to make sure that the person is going to like actually use it and before they go out and spend money. So like I spent a lot of time with the, with the customer before they just buy one. So, so like, a lot, a lot of it. You probably get a lot of feedback to them. They're like, what do I need to keep changing? What yeah, else do they keep yeah, wanting? Absolutely. Is there anything I can do different? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I, I probably, from the first one I built to now, it's probably gone through like six iterations. It's, it's, it doesn't, it's not a sexy iteration, but it's very, it makes it functional for certain different things. Like on the side of it, um, like when I would replace the, the filter, if you would take the filter out, like water would spill everywhere. So I put like a little ball valve end of it. So like now the ball valve helps stop the water. So that way you can take the filter out and the water's not all over the place. So very small little things that I've kind of worked along the way. And it's like, oh, I found a better fitting or connection that works better than another one. And the people that don't appreciate that, because if, if there's enough of those little annoyances, that could deter sure. someone right away, either to say something negative about it or like, sure. eh, I'm kind of done with this. Yeah. So now it's just very, um, very boutique. It's a lot of word of mouth. It's a lot of like, hey, um, this is who I got it from. So I'm not really trying to make it big, but I want to make it affordable, but so that way people can then purchase it and still have it aesthetically looking in their home or wherever they want to put it. Last question I'll kind of finish up with is what is the best time to use a cold tub? I know that's a very conflictive answer because 
some will say, oh, do in the morning because it'll drop your body temperature. And then it'll like push it back up to heat you up more in the morning. Some people do it multiple times a day. Some do it Other in contrast question. with hot cold. Like, So I say cold water is essentially a cup of coffee. So think about it like that in the easiest form. So for me, I actually don't do it in the morning. I kind of do it like mid-afternoon, like that two o'clock, three o'clock slump that some people get. You know, I'll, I'll just hop in the cold water and the, the endorphin rush is so high that like, I don't need that other cup of coffee. Um, that's how I used to do it, but now I use it strictly just for contrast. So I'll do 15 minutes in a sauna and then three minutes in the cold and I'll cycle that um, probably three or four days a week. Is is there a certain frequency people should look at to follow or is it more individualistic based on, I guess, their needs or if they're a highly active person or a lower active person? I think there's a lot of... Um, mixed data around like when when to use it some people nowadays say hey listen if you use a post-exercise like it hurt it helps it hurts your hypertrophy like by like 10 percent or 15 percent or something but the, base, yeah. the, the mass population that's going to notice that 15 or 20 percent decrease like they're not elite athletes you know elite athletes use it completely different than just a normal you know mom or you know a dad or just an overall like fitness person does so a lot of just kind of mixed things about about that so the overall answer like everything it depends <laughs> depends on how you want to use it right yeah well appreciate all the information knowledge some little nuggets you have in there um i guess where can people one find you and then two if this is an interest and they want to get into purchasing a cold tub do you have your own site or are you selling yep. them on Facebook marketplace? Like what is the, what is yep. that? So you, you can uh, find me um, Avanto, A-V-A-N-T-O, coldtubs.com or at Avanto cold tubs on Instagram. Perfect. So that will be in our show notes. If you guys are interested, you want to hit up Andrew, you want to talk more about any of the different topics. Cause again, he's went from starting with a company Contracting to the company, building his own company, photography, former athlete, doing pictures with athletes at multiple levels of athletics. Um, you know, an individual that has a wide spectrum of expertise and has been able to do stuff from the ground zero to where he's at now. So you don't always find people like that all the time. So definitely appreciate the the wisdom and the words that you were able to give us today. Of course. Thanks for having me.